Well, again, I want to say a warm welcome to you. So glad that you chose to worship with us today. I'm excited to be back with you and so excited to be beginning this new series that we've titled Waiting. And as you can see in the, in the role there, we're, we're thinking about what it means to be waiting in this life. Uh, earlier this year, we did a sermon series over the life of David, and we saw in David's life there was a moment when he was a young boy that he was anointed by the prophet of God to become king of an entire nation. But what's so interesting about that situation is that this man came, anoints him to be king, and then David, rather than going to become king, goes right back to what he was doing, which was standing out in a field with a bunch of sheep like the youngest in his family was supposed to be doing. And he went into a season of waiting on the fulfillment that this promise that God has spoken over his life. And when we saw that story in the scriptures, and then as I encountered many of you after that particular Sunday, so many of you approached me and said, man, that's me. That's us, that's, that's our family, or, or I've been in that waiting place for weeks or for months or maybe even years, and you talked to me about how you really resonated with that, and so we have been thinking since that day about this particular sermon series, knowing that there's so many of you in this room, so many of us in this room just doing life that find ourselves in a season of waiting. Maybe we're waiting on a promise that we feel like God has spoken into our life that has not yet been fulfilled. Maybe we're waiting on the right one to come along. Maybe we're waiting on the end of the semester so we can be done with those classes that we're in right now, praise God. Maybe we're waiting on a past memory to finally be forgotten and fade away because it's so painful. Maybe we're waiting on a a new beginning, a fresh start. Maybe you're waiting on a new boss at work. Or maybe you're waiting on a promotion, or maybe you're waiting on a raise or some sort of Christmas bonus at the end of the year. Maybe you're waiting on your kids to make it out of this phase that they seem to be in that's just driving you crazy. Maybe you're waiting on your grown kids to come back to God after they've walked their own way. So many of us are waiting. We find ourselves waiting in this life, and this season is is a perfect opportunity for us to look into the Word of God and what it has to say to us about waiting because we're celebrating Advent, which is a season of waiting, waiting on the coming Messiah. But there's interesting things about waiting because you can wait with hope or you can wait without hope, right? I mean, just really practically, Thanksgiving holidays, some of you found yourselves on crowded roads and you're in the left-hand lane and you're just trying to get home and you're waiting on the person to move over in front of you. Can I get an amen in the room when the person in the left lane is not even driving the speed limit and you're just waiting? Is this person ever going to get over? That's one of my biggest pet peeves. I'll mention that a couple times a year just in case you're wondering. But Thanksgiving holiday, it seems to be highlighted all the more, and so we end up finding ourselves trying to pass them around the right, which of course you're not supposed to do, and it's dangerous, and it's just, man, just get out of the way, right? You're waiting, but there's no hope. There's no hope because some people are just stuck in that left lane, and you just think, this is never going to change. We're never going to get home, and you wish that there could at least be some hope in the waiting. But there, there can be hope in the waiting. That's what I want to submit to us today, that not all of our waiting is just waiting with no hope. In fact, as I thought about this, I thought about the fact that so many of the things that we're facing, we really, we have an opportunity for two different experiences, whatever it is you're waiting on today. Again, whether you're waiting on some relationship to shift or whether something to happen at work or, or something in your own personal life or a promise from God, there can be waiting where there's no hope, which is a real drag and can be very depressing and cause a lot of anxiety and all sorts of things for us as human beings when we're waiting without hope. Or we can wait with hope. And as I thought about it, I realized that just very simply to, to put it frankly, there, you can wait without hope. There, there's waiting without hope, but there's Never, never, never hope without waiting. I want you to think about that just for just a moment. You can wait without hope, but there's never hope without waiting. Now, why is that? Because if we got everything that we wanted right when we wanted it, then there would be no reason to have a hopeful anticipation of something to come. But that is not the human experience, is it? It is not the human experience to get everything that we want right now, immediately, The human experience is that there's always waiting, therefore hope comes into the picture. And what is hope? Hopeful is, hope, being hopeful is an expectation of good to come. It's an expectation of good to come. So we can wait without hope. We can wait without any expectation of good. We can can wait and just kind of cross our fingers or roll the dice or hope that the stars align just right for us, just wishful thinking. 
or we can have a biblical experience, a God encounter with this idea of hope, this gift that God gives us where there is an anticipation of good to come from our season of waiting. So there's gonna be waiting, and we can wait without hope, but we can also wait with hope. In fact, there's never hope without waiting. And so since the two of those things go together, we wanna spend some time talking about it. And we're gonna look in scripture today, and actually over the next four weeks, including today, at the life of Esther. Esther was a, uh, a biblical uh, figure in, in history, um, that lived during what was called the, the Babylonian exile, or it was when the, the people of God had been kidnapped out of, their, out of the promised land. They had been taken captive by the Babylonians. They're taken as slaves to a whole other territory, to the region of Persia, which is today what we would know as Iran and kind of that area of the world. And they've been there uh, for quite a long time. You might remember if you grew up around church or know some of the Bible stories, a guy by the name of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den, and uh, some of those particular stories. These were going on uh, before the time of Esther, about 100 years before the time of Esther. And then what happens is a guy named Nehemiah uh, shows up on the scene, and he is allowed to take some of the people of God back to the promised land. Maybe you've heard the story of Nehemiah. But in the midst of this, some of the Jews return back to the promised land. Some of them remain in captivity in the region of Persia and um, Babylonian uh, Empire. And what's interesting about this is we don't know why. We don't know if they were just lazy and didn't want to go back. We don't know if they had integrated into where they were. We don't know if they didn't have the financial means to get back. We don't know if it was disobedience. We don't, we don't know. But what we know is that we find this group of people that have remained. They, they did not go back with the first wave of Jews with Nehemiah. So they're still in captivity and they find themselves in a place of waiting, waiting on the next thing. Waiting on maybe to be free instead of being captive. Waiting on maybe enough financial resources so that they can go. Some of them waiting on their spouse to kind of come around and say, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's go back to the promised land. They're waiting. And so this is where we're going to dive in today into the story of Esther. And I want to tell you about the first few chapters of Esther, and then we're going to begin to read some of it for our purposes today. But as we begin the, the book of Esther, the book of the Bible is called Esther. And so if you want to go back and read this a little bit later, you can just look up Esther. But at the beginning, the first chapter, there's a guy by the name of King Xerxes. And Xerxes is a very powerful king. He's overseeing the Babylonian empire, which from that time would have stretched from Greece all the way over past the Persian territories. And so this was a very vast, broad territory that he was in, in charge of. Well, Xerxes decided, hey, I want to have a party. I want to celebrate uh, my kingdom. And so he invited all of the princes from all over the kingdom to the capital where he was in Susa. And they began to have this massive party. And it says for seven days long, they just partied and drank. They ate and drank as much as they could. And it says that he poured out wine, King Xerxes poured out wine to all of his princes into gold goblets, and none of the goblets were the exact same. I mean, this is the, he's showing off his wealth, and they're drinking as much as they can drink. And in fact, it says that he said, I want the wine to flow and not stop to show my extravagance as a leader. And so can you imagine for seven days... Everybody in the capital was on a party binge, and they've been partying and partying and partying. And uh, in a drunken state, King Xerxes says, I want my queen to come, Queen Vashti. I don't know where Queen Vashti was, but she either got mad at her husband or she was drunk herself. I don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. But what it does tell us is that she said, no, I'm not coming. And so she did not show up, and King Xerxes, he got a little riled up about that. He didn't like the fact that his wife said no to him, and so he said, fine, well, you're no longer queen, and I'm going to find another queen. And so he deposes Queen Vashti and then sends out word to the entire kingdom that I'm looking for a new queen. And so his couriers go out into the entire kingdom, and they begin to gather up the most beautiful virgins of the land. And there is a young girl who's actually living right in the capital by the name of Esther, who was a Jew. She was a part of this group of people that had been taken captive from their homeland, had been brought to the Babylonian Empire. We're now 100 years past the, about, about past the time of Daniel, and she is now living with her cousin, her older cousin, by the name of Mordecai. Now, Mordecai uh, was an older man, and so her, Esther's mom and dad had both died, and so he took uh, his, his cousin uh, Esther to be uh, like his own child and had raised her. But when this word went out that they were looking for beautiful young women because Esther was a beautiful young woman, she was put forward as one that would move into the courts uh, of the king. And in fact, it worked out. 
She ended up moving into the courts, and the scriptures tell us that these women that were gathered up, they went through 12 months of beauty treatment. Now, some of the ladies in the room are like, man, that sounds pretty nice. Can you imagine living at a spa for 12 months where you're just bathed in perfume, and you've got mud? I don't know what they do. I've never been, but like a mud mask, I'm assuming, and some sort of nail deal, you know, pedicure. I mean, the whole deal. For 12 months, they're getting these ladies all nice and cleaned up and preparing them to be in the presence of the king. And then they're brought before, the, uh, brought before the king, but Esther stood out amongst them all. King Xerxes recognizes the beauty of Esther, and Esther becomes the next queen. And so Esther, this woman who uh, had lost both of her parents, who found herself in a place of despair being raised by her older cousin in a land that was not her own amongst the people that were not her own, all of a sudden finds herself elevated to royal status and is in the royal court. Now, this is good news because about this time, Mordecai, her older cousin who had raised her, hears of a plot to kill the king, to kill King Xerxes. There's two guys, two guards standing out uh, in the courtyard, and Mordecai overhears this, so he goes to his cousin Esther, who's now queen, and he says, Esther, you need to tell your husband there's a plot to kill him. And so she goes in, she tells the king about this plot. Of course, she's very thankful. They're able to round up all of the folks that have plotted to kill him. And so now Esther is not only the beauty that has become queen, but she's now the trusted confidant of the king, all because Mordecai had passed along this information. Well, in this kind of reshuffling of political power there at Susa, there is a, another man that, raised, that is raised up to power, and his name is Haman. Now, Haman was a Canaanite, and if you're familiar at all about the, the scripture stories, you know that you have the Jews and you have the Canaanites all fighting over the same bit of land, but they were all taken captive together to Babylon, and so those old rivalries from back in the day are still very much alive today. Haman, a Canaanite, and Queen Esther and her cousin Mordecai are Jews, and so Haman is walking down the road one day. He's been elevated now in the new political order. And he sees Mordecai. This is Queen Esther's cousin. And, and Mordecai doesn't bow down to him like everybody else is doing. And he gets mad about that. As a Canaanite, he expects everybody to bow down to him in the kingdom. But especially the Jews better be bowing down. When he sees Mordecai not bowing down, he says, well, I'm going to take care of this guy. So uh, Haman, he hatches a plan. He says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to kill every, all the Jews. We're going to kill all of them. Now, up to this point, Esther has kept her identity as a Jew secret, and so Haman has no idea that the queen is also a Jew, but she definitely knows that Mordecai uh, was one. And so he uh, casts lots, basically, is what the scripture says. In other words, he rolls a dice just to pick a day, and what he says is we're going to roll a dice, and whatever it lands on that day, we're going to declare that all the Jews across the kingdom should be put to death. So word begins to get out that he's rolled the dice and that all the Jews are going to be put to death and Mordecai gets word of this, and so he obviously is distraught. He knows that his life is in danger as well as all of their countrymen. And so he sends word uh, to Esther and says, Esther, you've got to do something to help us out here because we are all in trouble. You're going to have to go to the king and, and tell him what's going on. But this was not something that anybody was uh, really interested in doing because to go before the king without being called could mean your life. This is how King Xerxes just did, did things. Even his own wife, the queen, the queen, was not allowed to even go into his presence without his invitation. And so she finds herself, Queen Esther does, at a crossroads. What do I do? I know that the right-hand man to my husband is plotting to kill all of my people. That word has been passed on to me. How do I get us out of this situation? Is there hope? Is there hope in this situation, and this is where we pick up the story in chapter 4 of the book of Esther, beginning in verse 11. It'll be on the screen, and you can follow along as I read it to us. Esther says to Mordecai, after he asked her to go to the king, she says this, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king, uh, without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So in other words, what I just said, Mordecai, you, you, you don't understand. This can mean my life. I, I haven't been summoned. It's been 30 days. If he summoned me you know, yesterday or the day before because he wanted to see me, well, then we, we'd be in luck, right? I could kind of go in because he was already expecting me, and I could bring this matter up. But if I go, I could be put to death, Mordecai. 
When Esther's words were reported, this is verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you were in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther took these words, thought them over, and then sent this reply back to, Morde- back to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Wow. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Somewhere in this back and forth, Esther begins to realize, hey, this is a lot bigger than just my skin and my life. This is an entire people group. This is my family. This is my cousin who raised me and all of our, uh, all of our other extended family. If I don't do something, something terrible could happen because of this man, Haman. And so she decides, I've got to go in. Now, can you imagine being in her setting? Can you imagine just being in her shoes for just a moment that you're literally making a decision of life or death for the sake of other people? Can you imagine what would you want to know in that circumstance? What what kind of assurance would you want to have? Boy, would you and I be looking for assurance? And so sure enough, Esther says, I've got to know that God is with me if I'm going to go in and do this. And so she sends back the message, and here's what I want to do. I want to pull out three things that we see about what it takes to build the endurance of hope when we're waiting on something. She's obviously waiting on this encounter. She doesn't know what's going to happen. She's she's unsure how this is going to play out. She's in her own season of waiting, just like you're in a season of waiting, just like I am in a season of waiting for something in this life. She finds herself in this season of waiting, but she's not wanting to wait without hope. She's not wanting to wait with just, well, I'll cross my fingers. Well, I just, I guess we hope it's going to work out all right. No, no, no. She wants to invite hope. She wants to invite that confident expectation that something good is going to happen. She's wanting to invite hope into the, into the setting. And so what we're talking about today is how do we build, you and I, how do we build that endurance of hope when we are in our season of waiting? This is how Esther did it. We see in verse 14, the second part of verse 14, where it says this, it says, who knows, But maybe that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This was Mordecai talking to Esther. Why is this important? This is very important because you and I need to remember that God is always at work behind the scenes. In your waiting, you can go to the bank with the fact that God is always at work behind the scenes. And with Esther's life, this is what she was banking on. This is what Mordecai was banking on when he says, who knows? Maybe we thought you going to the castle was, was kind of a, a God's, you know, saying, hey, you grew up an orphan. Esther, let me bless you. But, but he says, no, no, who knows? Maybe, maybe it was actually, maybe actually you were given the beauty that you were given. Maybe actually you were in the capital right near the king's palace, all for the sake of this moment right here, Esther. Who knows? Maybe it could be that you've come to your royal position for such a time as this. In my own life, I've seen this over and over and over again. Have you encountered God working behind the scenes in your own life? I know so often in my life, I have misinterpreted the signs of the times, not understanding what was happening, and then a few years down the road, I look back and I go, oh, look what God was doing, and I had no idea in the moment. In my moment of pain, in my moment of questioning, in my moment of where's God, in my moment of does God hear me, Is God going to show up? I've looked back over my shoulder and seen that God was working all the time. Do you know God in that way? Do you trust God in that way to be working at all times, even when it is the darkest moment, even when you're about ready to give up all hope? Have you thought about the fact that God is working behind the scenes all of the time? I've shared the story before. I want to share it again because many of you are new to our church. But I, I was a walk-on football player at Baylor University. And by the way, Baylor's 11-1. and one. Just wanted you to know that. Um, 
and playing for the Big 12 championship. Anyway, um, I was a walk-on receiver there, and so, you know, it was kind of the whole Rudy story. It's like, you know, skinny white guy who's just trying to stay alive and not get killed, you know, by the 300-pounders on our team and, and trying to earn a scholarship. And from when I was a little kid, so I was born in Georgia, and I grew up in Florida, and I don't know if it was like, you know, because everyone else was either Gator or Seminole or a Hurricane fan. I was like, well, I was born in Georgia, so I'll be a Bulldog fan. So I just, I grew up a Georgia fan. And from the earliest that I can remember, I had a dream of playing on a scholarship at the University of Georgia. That's, I mean, that's what I wanted to do. And so I went to Ray Goff's football camp, and, you know, I did, I did all of the stuff. But here's the, the fact of the matter is, I was a Division II athlete, not a Division I athlete. That's just what it is. I mean, no Division I school was going to offer me a scholarship. The Naval Academy, they offered me a scholarship. But that, anyway, so I wasn't going to get to play big SEC football. That's just not what I was going to get to do unless I was going to walk on somewhere. Well, in the midst of the journey, uh, as I was praying about this, we ended up having some friends that were part of the football program at Baylor University. And so it, it worked out that I could get what's called a preferred walk-on, which basically means we're not going to offer you a scholarship, but you can come be on the team, and we've looked at all your film, and we know that you're good enough to be on our team, and maybe you'll earn a scholarship, so why don't you come and be a part? And so I let go of my dream to play for the Georgia Bulldogs, and I moved to Texas and went to this school called Baylor, which I had really never even heard of before that, and ended up having an amazing experience. Moms and dads, Baylor is an amazing school. If you've got kids that are growing up, you want to take a look at it. I had an amazing experience, walked on the team and was on my way to earning a scholarship. And then years, we're talking 10 years, guys. I mean, years of staying home from family vacations to work out with the football team, years of being up early and out late and the only one at the football stadium with trash cans set up and running routes on trash cans and working my tail off. 10 years of that had built to this moment at Baylor where I'm now uh, about to become an upperclassman and have the opportunity to earn a scholarship. We go into spring football where walk-ons earn their scholarships and I tore my hamstring and the dream was, was lost. We went into the next year, and I'm right back with the rest of the walk-ons because I didn't uh, play uh, the spring because of my torn hamstring, and I realized that I had lost my opportunity to ever earn a scholarship. That was probably the hardest thing that I had faced in my life up to that point. I would say that was what I call my first God wound. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Where something happens in your life, and you, you just find yourself going, God, where are you? This hurts so bad, and I've tried to follow you as best I know how. Where are you? Now, for, for many of you in this room, you might think, oh, you, you didn't get a scholarship. Big deal. A lot of kids don't get scholarships. But guys, this was my whole life. I had a dream to play college football, and I had worked for years to this point. I'd even told, I'd stood up in FCA meetings, you know, the, the Christian kid, and said, you know, I'm going to serve Jesus, and I feel like God's told me I'm going to get a scholarship, and well, that wasn't God's plan. And so I find myself finishing my college football as a walk-on and, and got to do some fun things and travel with the team and we got a conference championship and there were some fun things involved in that, but my dream was never realized. And so I'm walking around with this underlying question mark of does God really care? Is he really there? Does he know what's going on in my life? Fast forward a few years later, I find myself now married, living in Berlin, Germany and planning a church. And we're going through language school, and I'm doing terrible at language. I'm, I, 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 don't, I don't learn languages easy. My wife picks them up like this. So she's half fluent in German already, and I'm, str I'm on the struggle bus. I'm like, hello, guten tag, and that's about it. You know, like, I, I'm just terrible, right? And I'm like, Lord, this is horrible. And I finally figured out, okay, I need to get involved in something, not just classwork, but I need to be in the community somewhere where people are speaking German and then doing something together, and that'll help me learn it faster. And I heard about a, a, it's a bunch of Germans playing American football. And I thought, well, maybe I can get hooked up with this team and I'll go and I'll be their, their, their chaplain or something. So I end up meeting these guys. There was one sports bar in town that showed one NFL game a week. And so we, I would go there to watch the one NFL game, my little taste of American culture. And one night I'm talking to the guy behind the bar and he's serving all these people drinks. And I'm like, hey man, I love Jesus. Do you know Jesus? And I'm just doing my best to share Jesus with the guy and he finds out I'm an American, that I love football, and that I'm there to plant a church. And he's like, well, you would, you would enjoy getting to know these guys over here. They all play American football, but they're all German. So I go over to the table and end up sitting down, and I'm like, hey, guys, 
I know this may sound weird, but you guys want a chaplain? They didn't even know what a chaplain was. They were like, what? What is that? You know, they kind of this weirdo talking to them about Jesus. And I was like, well, you know, I walked on, I played football. And they, you played football? Yeah, I played football in college. And they were like, well, why don't you come on out? So I go out to these guys' practice, and guys, long story short, not only did I get to be a chaplain for the team where I did a devotional before every game and was able to pray over those players, but they ended up inviting me to be a coach for the wide receivers, which is what I had played. And that first year coaching the wide receivers, we went to what is called the German Bowl and won the German National Championship, which was amazing in and of itself. But it gets even better than that. Not only did we win a national championship, but one of my players was the first one to come to faith and be baptized. And his girlfriend as well came to faith and was baptized, the first members of our church in Germany. And then they asked me to do their wedding. And I remember there on their wedding day, as I was thinking about all of the little things that had happened and how I was standing there marrying a couple who had nothing to do with God, who had been living together and didn't even know Jesus and wouldn't have even known me from Adam had I not walked into that sports bar of all places, and had I not been accepted into that circle of football players because of the experience that I'd had at Baylor University. Guys, do you know that that standing there at that altar, I realized that God was saying to me, Van, for such a time as this, everything that had happened in your life up to this point was for such a time as this. And when I thought about it, and I thought about what would I rather have if God could take me back to those days at college where it was a scholarship or not a scholarship. But this question would be changed to, Van, you can, you can have a scholarship and you can kind of have that dream fulfilled or I can use this to humble you even more, change the direction of your life away from business where you thought you were going into pressing into me, which would eventually turn into a year of mission work, which would turn into going overseas to plant a church as a pastor, now standing here marrying this couple who would have never known you and who knows where they would have spent eternity. Which would you rather have? Would you stand here as a coach and as a pastor or would you rather go back and have that scholarship? And guys, it was a no-brainer. The friendships that I have with James and Sarah today and the rest of the folks from our church, I wouldn't trade for anything. You see, God was working behind the scenes. He was building experiences in my life that I had no idea what he was up to. What about you? Do you realize that there is a for such a time as this happening right now in your life? Right now in your life, God is working behind the scenes. He is shifting things on the chessboard. God is the master chess player. And he's not playing against you. He's, you're on the same team. And if you've ever played chess before, you know that the whole game is built around getting the pieces on the board in just the right position so you can say, checkmate. And when I stood there at that altar marrying that couple in Berlin, Germany, God was saying, checkmate. What about you? Are you trusting him to move your life around and even to sometimes move others' lives around? Are you willing to be patient? When you're the piece on the board and he's not moving you right now and you're just standing there and you're going, God, am I ever going to get moved on this board? And God's saying, hey, be patient right now because I'm moving some other things around. And as soon as I have those other pieces in place, then it's going to be your time to step into what you're waiting for. Are you trusting God to be the God who is working behind the scenes in your life to where one day you'll be able to say to God for such a time as this? For such a time as this. That's the first thing we see. We remember that God is always working behind the scenes. There's a second thing that we see, and that's that we should submit our lives by waiting on him. What uh, What does Esther say? She says, fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and my attendants will fast as you do. This was the ancient way of saying, God, we trust you. <laughs> we, we've got nothing. We, we, we need hope. We need the confident expectation that good is coming. And the only way to make sure that's going to happen is to put ourselves in your hands, submitting our lives to him through a season of fasting. Now, twice a year as a church, if you're new to Cedar Crest, we take three days twice a year where we say as a church, we're setting these aside for a corporate time of prayer and fasting. Fasting is simply going without food. It's exactly what it sounds like. Um, And we as a church are gonna begin a fast actually this week, beginning tomorrow morning, Monday through Wednesday. We're calling a church-wide fast where you're invited to be a part of doing what people of God have been doing for thousands of years, where we say, you know what? I can't do it on my own. I can't do it in my own strength. I need to submit 
myself to God's will. And our way of doing that is saying, God, we ultimately, we trust you for everything. And we put food to the side and we take a time to encounter him. Rather than going to food or rather than spending time on a meal, we spend that time in prayer. So here's what I want to say. There may be some of you in the room that are like, I have never willingly skipped a meal in my entire life, and I don't plan on doing that anytime soon. I get that, and I understand that. Some of you may have had to fast overnight before a medical procedure or something, so you may be a little bit familiar with with what this is. But here's what I want you to know about fasting. You know, you can actually go without food for multiple days, even multiple weeks, and be perfectly fine. In fact, it's actually healthy for you from time to time. That's why the whole cleanse, uh, cleanse trend came along where everyone's like, okay, I'm fasting because I'm cleansing all the toxins out of my system. Fasting can actually be a, a bring about really uh, good health benefits to your body. Now, you don't want to go without liquids. You want to have a lot of liquids, so you want to drink a lot of water uh, while you're fasting. In the scriptures, it said that they didn't eat or drink. I would not necessarily recommend that unless Really, God has said, this is what you have to do, and then only then would I do it in direct contact with a doctor who's able to walk you through that because dehydration is a real deal that can hurt you. But going without food will not hurt you for a couple days. That I can promise you. Now, your stomach is going to say, what are you doing? I need some food right now. You're going to get hangry like I do probably, and you know the whole world is about to explode because you missed breakfast, you know, and that, that, that feeling is going to arise, but you will not die. Your body will be okay. And so here's my invitation to you. If you've never fasted before, I want to encourage you over the next three days to try fasting one meal. If you fasted one meal before, I want to challenge you to go 24 hours. If you've done 24 hours with us, maybe in the past or at some place else, then I want to encourage you to go for two days. And if you've done two days, let's go the whole three days together. But here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to be asking God for breakthrough in our places of waiting. Where are you waiting Where are you standing on the chessboard of life and trusting that God is working behind the scenes? And where are you willing to say, God, I'm not going to move myself. I'm going to wait on you. I'm submitting myself to your process. And Lord, by giving up food and spending time aligning my heart with you in prayer and in worship, that's what you're doing. You're humbling yourself before God. And you're saying, God, it's not about me. It's about you. Guys, I've seen amazing things happen when church um, family members get around this. We've seen life groups fast together for one particular family in their group. Uh, A family in Texas that uh, we were friends with, they were having uh, developmental issues with one of their children. They had been to different doctors, and they were needing breakthrough, and they were waiting on God. And this particular life group got together, and they said, we're going to fast and pray together for your your son. And when they did that, at the end of that time, I I, I wish I could say that everything was... uh, in right order, it wasn't that, but they had definitely seen breakthrough happen, and they had seen, they had gotten the help that they had needed, and they had seen progress in the areas that they were praying for. Guys, this has real power on it when life groups will gather around it and fast and pray together. It has power on it when a church gathers around and prays for their community, prays for one another. It has power on it when you as an individual say, God, I've been running. Or I've been trying to kick the door in in this season of waiting. I've been trying to do it in my own strength. I've been trying to convince that person that they shouldn't leave. And I've been trying to fix it, but they just walked out anyway. I don't know what else to do. This is your opportunity to say, okay, it's not in my strength, but it's in your strength, God. And even if the circumstances don't work out the way I was expecting, I I trust you to be moving things around behind the scenes. And I'm going to submit myself to you. So that's my invitation to you as a church family. Beginning tomorrow morning, whatever God would ask you to do, whether it's a meal, whether it's a day, whether it's multiple days, we're going to have three days, Monday through Wednesday, of a corporate fast, just like Esther did, submitting our lives by waiting on him. And then as a life group, I'm going to encourage you, if you're fasting together, maybe go out and break that fast for dinner on Wednesday and then come up to church at 630 and join us for an encounter night of more worship and prayer, and we'll have communion together. Uh, Maybe you'll wait till after the encounter night to break your fast. That's up to you. But let's fast these next three days, and let's ask God for breakthrough. Let's ask him for breakthrough where you need it. Your place of waiting, where are you waiting on God to show up? Bring our prayers and our petitions to God. There's another story in Scripture where Jesus himself was taught about this. His disciples had tried to minister to a family, and they weren't having any luck. They were praying, and nothing was happening. And Jesus showed up and he prays and boom, everything's, everything's fixed and put in right order. And they say, well, what did we do wrong? What happened here? And Jesus' response were, some only come out through prayer and fasting. There's a, a biblical invitation by Jesus 
modeled us by Esther from Old Testament to New Testament. When God's people submit themselves to God in this way, God shows up. Now, there may be some in the room that have medical issues and you can't fast food. I would encourage you to find something that you give up for the next three days. Um, maybe you're a, a student or an athlete or, or some, some, for some other reason, you cannot go without uh, enough calories. I get that. that that's going to be some of you in the room. Find something that you are saying, God, I'm setting this aside, this normal routine or this thing that I would like to have. This is my worship to you to say, I desire you more than I desire this. I'm gonna set this thing to the side. For me, it's gonna be food. And uh, again, I would encourage you to drink a lot of water. Juice is okay as well. Sometimes juice even helps a little bit because it has a little bit of uh, sugar in it and it keeps your blood sugar from, from going way too low. Um, but guys, let's do this together. Let's take the model of Esther. One last thing that I wanna point out as we close the service today is that we see at the end, I love what she says there at the end of verse 16. She says, and if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. Was that a, oh, woe is me, you know, here I, here I go. No, I don't, I don't believe it was. I believe that it was a way of saying, I'm putting my confidence in God alone, not in an outcome. Whatever happens to me, happens to me, I'm, I'm, but I'm putting my confidence in God. See, by, like my story, if I had put my, my hope in an outcome and earning the scholarship, and if I had stopped there, then think about all I would have missed that God had in store for me if I just said, well, God didn't do it. God just showed up. God did not show up in the way I expected him to, and so I guess God's not real, or I guess God doesn't care. Well, see you later, God. I'll just go on with my life. No, no, no. I, I had to wrestle with it. I'll be honest with you. But I eventually came to the realization that my hope can't be in an outcome because in this life, you're going to have highs and lows. There's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. And that is a human experience. So if our hope is in an outcome, you're going to be disappointed and let down at some point in time. But if we catch that it's not about the outcome, it's actually about a person, the person of Jesus. And we're putting our confidence in him and not in the outcome then now all of a sudden we're able to enter into this big mystery that God is weaving a beautiful tapestry and he has good plans for your life. And although there will be highs and there will be lows, that if you'll press into him, he is working all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Are you putting your confidence in God? Are you putting your confidence in an outcome? Do you need hope today? Do you need hope? Are you waiting? And are you asking God to show up in your life? Guys, I believe that when we put our confidence in God rather than an outcome, when we're willing to trust and believe that God is always at work behind the scenes working for our good, and we're willing to submit ourselves to him, we will find ourselves right in the middle of God's will. I'm not going to tell you what happened to Esther. Some of you will go home and cheat and read it anyway, or maybe you already know the story. We'll pick the story back up next week, and we'll continue to see what happens with Esther. But for today, my challenge for you and I is that we would leave this place knowing that we don't have to wait without hope. You can have hope in your waiting, and hope is not a thing. It's not wishful thinking. Hope is a person, and his name is Jesus, and he loves you, and he wants to encounter you today. Would you stand with me, please? I'd like to ask our prayer team to come to the front. We're gonna have a time of response here at the end where we wanna pray for your waiting. We don't have to wait for Wednesday night to do that. We can do that right here in this, in this space. Some of you guys are really dealing with some hard things in life. I know that. I know because the conversations that we have with you and the emails that you send us and the way that you let your life group pastors know what's going on in your life, that's the right thing to do. You've invited community in, but I'm very well aware that there's hurt in this room. There are those of you in this room that are confused. There are some of you that are carrying around what, what I termed a, a God wound where you, you felt, I, I don't understand how this could be going on. Doesn't God see me? Doesn't, doesn't God care? And I want you to know that God sees you and God does care and he wants to be your strength in the waiting place. He wants to be your hope in the waiting place this morning. So as we sing this next song, whatever need you have in your life. Guys, don't leave here without allowing us to partner with you in prayer and inviting the presence of God into that place. Say, well, I, I've gotten prayer before. Look, if you're still in the waiting place, I'd, I'd be down here every single Sunday. I, I just, I would keep coming. Anytime someone said they're offering prayer, well, here I come. 
When I was in my waiting spot, that was me. I just, if God was being offered anywhere, I wanted some of that. If somebody was willing to pray for me, well, then I'm coming down every single week until God shows up. We're going to be persistent in our prayer, and we're going to expect God to meet us in that. So as we sing this next song, guys, don't be shy. Don't say, well, my grandmama already prayed for me. Come on down here. Let us pray for you. Like I said, we've seen God do amazing things. He answers prayer. And I don't know what the outcome might be, but I do know that when we partner with you in prayer, you're going to encounter God. And that outcome will always be his presence. And again, God is always working for good behind the scenes. Let's pray together and then we'll respond in worship. Jesus, we love you. And Lord, we again just submit our hearts and our souls to you today. Lord, we thank you for the message of hope. We thank you that we don't have to be a people that wait without hope. But God, we thank you that we build endurance of hope and waiting when we are submitting ourselves to you. When we are trusting and remembering that you're working behind the scenes even when we don't see it. And Lord, we again just say we're not putting our hope in an outcome. We're putting our hope in you, a person, a real person who overcame death and hell and wants relationship with us. So God, as we respond with this song of worship today, we say that you are our living hope and we love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray.